Uh, hello, everyone. Today is the first session of the Bishkek Arbitration Day, which will be devoted to the dispute resolution in the time of pandemic. And during our session, we will talk mostly, uh, we will try to elaborate the question, can the arbitration be the answer? Uh, I would like to greet everyone who joined us. I know that we have a lot of participants from around the world. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Natalia Lyonkina. I am Associate Professor of the American University of Central Asia. I'm as well advocate in a private legal firm in Kyrgyzstan and um, the arbitrator in International Court of Arbitrator under the Chamber of Commerce in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's a special, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to moderate this session. Um, today we have a really star panelist and I want to say special thanks to organizers for for inviting so uh, distinguished panelists and let me first start by introducing our speakers. Um, I have a pleasure to introduce Mr. Ilya Putilian, who is a co-founder of Putin and Sipel. He has been recently appointed as court member of the Tashkent International Arbitration Center and hold a position of a young professor at the American University of Central Asia. My congratulations, dear colleague. Uh, Ilya uh, worked as a deputy head of legal service at the Asian International Arbitration Center and secretary general of the Asian domain name uh, Dispute Resolution Center. As a part of this institution, Mr. Putilian co-lead a team of counsel and supervised more than 3,000 adjudication, arbitration, mediation, and domain name dispute cases. He represented and advised clients in more than 50 cases before the most uh, eminent uh, tribunals all around the world, foreign and domestic courts all, of all level, including the Russian Federation Supreme Court and international trade tribunals. Uh, welcome, dear Leah. Uh, the second, uh, our second speaker who I'm pleased to introduce is Yelena Peripilinskaya. She is a partner and the head of the CIS arbitration practice in at Integrity's international legal firm. She serves as a president of the Ukrainian Arbitration Association, member of international, uh, member of ICC International Court of Arbitration in Paris member of TIA Court of Arbitration, Russian Arbitration Association board, mem board member, and member of Global Steering Committee of Europe. Thank you very much for joining us for, from Ukraine. And let me move to our next eminent speaker, Mr. Alexander Miller. Uh, he is a barrister of Fontaine Court Chamber in London. He is one of the very few Russian-speaking advocates at the London Bar, and consequently has a busy CIS practice both as counsel and arbitrator. This summer, he is due to appear remotely in two substantial LCIA arbitration, one uh, a 500 million fraud claim arising of the collapse of Russian bank, and second one, 200 million fraud claim um, brought by Russian allies. We are happy to see you, Alexander, and uh, we hope that we have our fourth panelist. His name is Hafiz Virgi, maybe he join us just a little later. Uh, mm, he is a president of Dallas Dispute Resolution, an international arbitration institution. He also serves as an independent arbitrator. Uh, Hafiz previously spent over 10 years um, acting as a counsel at large international law firm in London, Paris, and Dubai. Hafiz is qualified in England and Wales and in France and regularly uh, writes and speaks on international arbitration. We hope he join us just a little later. Uh, dear colleague, I'm very happy to greet all of you, at least virtually. Uh, uh, I would inform our uh, participants that we decided not to prepare the formal convenient, uh, conventional presentation. We just tried to do the live free discussion on the main topic of our session. And uh, I hope that at the end of our session, we will have uh, maybe five or two minutes for a QR session. So you may uh, ask your question in, a in chat and I will announce it and we'll discuss it uh, at the end of our panel. 
Okay, and uh, I would like to inform you the main topic which we will discuss during our session. We will talk mostly about the pandemic influence, uh, the dispute resolution. Uh, all of us witnessing that the impact is rather significant and as a result of lockdown implemented to combat the spread of infection, core system of many countries have been paralyzed. No cases registered, no hearing held. The situation in Central Asia is not the exception of the rule. Uh, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan during the March and April, there were no, uh, there were no already uh, hearing during these months. The court system is uh, slow to adapt and react. The only viable option remains dispute resolution mechanism, um, alternative to litigation. And um, I would offer to go to the first question, which we planned for this session. Uh, it may sound rather provocative, but we want to discuss the role of arbitration for the CIS related disputes. Is the arbitration a default? or their preferred option uh, for CIS-related disputes. And uh, using my role of, arbit uh, of moderator of this session, I would like to start this discussion uh, and briefly present the situation uh, in Kyrgyzstan. I would like to briefly present the uh, practice of the um, International Court of Arbitration um, under the Chamber of Commerce of Kyrgyz Republic. It is the, one of the oldest it is the oldest institution in Kyrgyzstan. It was established more than 16 years ago. And now the list of arbitrators of ICA covers more than 400 arbitrators. Most part of them uh, belongs to the foreign jurisdiction. Uh, the total number of cases considered by the ICA is um, 1,022. Uh, of course, most of them are internal cases, but more than 60 cases uh, considered where the one or two parties uh, belong to the um, foreign jurisdiction. As a rule, it's a, it is a CIS country like a Russian Federation, uh, like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Ukraine. But uh, not only, uh, we have some cases uh, from uh, with participants far abroad, like uh, Germany, Germany, China, of course, uh, Great Britain, America. Uh, according to statistic, the plethora of cases considered by the ICA is uh, are devoted to the um, loan agreement, loan disputes, credit disputes. Uh, they are followed by the disputes on lease contract, uh, purchase contract, uh, service, and work contract. And um, in order to our participants more fully understand or accept the situation with arbitration in Kyrgyzstan, I would also add just highlight just a free element uh, which differ us from other, other jurisdiction. Uh, first of all, the arbitration, the status of arbitration here in Kyrgyzstan has a constitutional status. For us, it's very important uh, in a time of change. It's, uh, it gives uh, a sense of stability for the arbitration center here in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the second one, we, we have no any uh, procedure for setting aside of arbitra arbitration award. It means the total, total uh, final status of arbitration award, which cannot be appealed or set aside uh, neither procedurally nor uh, substantially. And the third issue, uh, arbitration in Kyrgyzstan have, uh, have the rather wide uh, competence. Uh, for instance, we have no such limitation, any limitation for, for instance, for corporative disputes or for disputes with the um, state authorities, because in the special law on the public procuracy, procurement or the private, private, uh, public private partnership, uh, uh, we have a direct uh, link uh, to the arbitration. And uh, you may know it's a rather hot topic of our current day. Uh, the deputies, the legislators currently initiated the new law, the draft law, which uh, offered to transfer tax cases to the arbitration. Okay, in order not to abuse the power of moderator, I will stop at this here. And I would like to 
uh, give the floor to other speakers who will cover, who will observe the situation with arbitration in other arbitration institution. And uh, first of all, I would uh, like to offer Alexander to share with us the last statistic of LCIA. And after that, I will be happy to hear other speakers of our panel. Please, Alexander. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those uh, closer to Bishkek. Um, the situation so far as England is concerned is, is easy to analyse because the LCIA, which is our main arbitral institution, has published some statistics recently um, for cases started in 2018. Um, there were 317 cases uh, in and nearly 10% of the parties involved uh, came from CIS countries, so quite a high proportion, um, mostly from Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. But in addition to that, there was also a significant number from Cyprus uh, and from the Caribbean, five, six, seven percent from, from Cyprus and the same from Caribbean. And uh, a lot of those um, will also involve Russian parties, because obviously, as we know, it's very common for a CIS entity to do business through Cypriot holding companies. So um, in total, it's a very significant part of the LCIA's work. Uh, I, I should say, though, for comparison, that um, the figures in the English commercial courts, that our state courts, are not very different from that. Um, for the same period, um, something like 3 or 4% of the parties in English court proceedings came from Kazakhstan uh, and a slightly lower number from Russia and, and Ukraine, in total about 9%. So I would say England as a venue uh, remains very popular for CIS parties that roughly equally split between arbitration and litigation. Um, thank you, Alexander. Um, I would uh, give the floor Yelena Prepilinska, who will continue the presentation. Uh, thank you, Natalia, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you this online and to talk about uh, the developments in the region. Uh, so, with regard to the default choice for CIS parties, I think it's still uh, the first choice is the choice of local institutions, whatever the uh, party uh, comes from. So, uh, for example, from for Ukrainian parties, the first choice would be uh, our main arbitration institution called uh, ICAC uh, or International Commercial Arbitration Court at the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and it has in average three or, or four hundred international cases per year. So it's quite considerable case load. Uh, and uh, then the second choice uh, would be some local institutions in the region, probably depending on the counterparties. So for intra-CIS uh, disputes, it would be most probably one of the CIS uh, institutions. And then uh, there are a variety of uh, international or regional institutions. And I think the uh, top three uh, are, are the main uh, arbitration centers uh, in Europe. So ICC in Paris, uh, SCC in Stockholm, and LCIA in London. Uh, so each year the statistic could probably differ, but in general it's more or less uh, the same. We also have uh, some cases in Vienna, and we have, uh, returning to London, we have quite many cases uh, in uh, uh, GAFTA and FOSFA, uh, so uh, as, as uh, there are a lot of uh, export of grain and oil from the region. Um, so this is more or less the, the, the overview. And just to mention uh, whether it's a default option or not, in Ukraine, uh, historically, when Ukraine got independence, um, uh, Ukrainian government promoted using arbitration for any international contracts. We had a governmental decree uh, with a kind of te template of uh, com international commercial contracts, which uh, literally said to have an arbitration clause. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. 
Uh, Ilya, can you add something to the discussion? Yeah, I would, I would say uh, the interest in arbitration in Central Asia is growing, of course. Uh, just name but few developments. Uh, the establishment of Tashkent International Arbitration Center, the establishment of new uh, Bishkek Arbitration Center for mining, uh, conferences, a number of conferences held uh, in Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. So this uh, shows that if it were not the preferred option, it would be the preferred or default option in the years to come. Uh, as far as the venues for arbitration is concerned, I would say in Central Asia, the preference, of course, historically is Sweden and Stockholm, but there are also some unconventional venues, so to say, like Switzerland. Most of the contracts with Chinese parties, no matter what the value is, has have the uh, Swiss Chambers clause, and this is surprising. So the parties, even for small transactions, say under 500,000 euros, are eager to uh, explore arbitration as the means of dispute resolution. And this is fascinating. I, I would say in Central Asia, in most uh, international contracts, the arbitration clause would be the default mechanism or default clause to be included. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Uh, dear colleague, I'm very grateful for such an excellent start. And please let me move on to the next question. Uh, let's let's try to discuss the benefits uh, of the arbitration for CIS countries. Why do CIS parties opt for the arbitration? Start. Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the uh, major advantages uh, of international arbitration is enforceability of uh, arbitral awards. Uh, I think it's even more important for the CIS region because historically uh, the CIS states did not have so many bilateral or multilateral treaties on uh, mutual assistance in civil or commercial matters. That uh, means that uh, they do not have a treaty basis for enforcement of state uh, court judgments. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it was always a problem. And still, I think the number of those uh, bilateral and multilateral treaties is not very high for any of the CIS uh, states. And that is why the, the uh, tool of uh, available in an international uh, arbitration, uh, namely uh, the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, is a very uh, unique and very useful tool uh, when uh, we have a dispute uh, on the international commercial contract. And uh, for now, I have just checked the Ancetral website. So there are 163 parties uh, to New York Convention. So this is amazing. I think this is one of the, the most successful international treaties today. And this uh, makes uh, the international arbitration so successful because it grants the same region of uh, regime of enforcement of, of arbitral awards almost all over the world. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lena. Um, Alexander? Yes, so another often cited uh, benefit of arbitration is confidentiality. Um, Arbitration proceedings are always conducted in private. Um, they're usually also confidential, meaning that the parties and the arbitrators are not allowed to refer to the arbitration materials outside the arbitration. Um, that can be very attractive if your contract is about a sensitive subject or if you're, you're a state and your state officials are likely to have to give evidence and, and don't want to give evidence in public and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the extent to which confidentiality applies does differ between different rules and, and jurisdictions. So it is something that you need to check um, before uh, agreeing to a particular uh, type of arbitration or a type of a particular seat. But generally, there will be some degree of confidentiality imposed on the process. Um, I think it's also worth noting that in practice, confidentiality is not always uh, absolute. Uh, so, for example, there can be court proceedings that are arising out of the arbitration 
which inevitably puts information in the public domain. Um, so it shouldn't be assumed that nothing will leak into, into the public domain, but that is certainly less likely to happen with arbitration than, than court proceedings. And if I could just make a link to the title of our session, which is about the impact of the, the pandemic, um, I, there are, I think, risks to, to confidentiality um, by um, inherent in the current trend for, for remote arbitrations, um, because, for example, how do you ensure that unauthorised people don't watch the proceedings or um, record the proceedings um, and distribute recordings and so on. It does become more complicated to ensure confidentiality. And I, I'm not sure that uh, those questions have been fully answered yet, but perhaps we can discuss that more later on. Uh, may I add something about confidentiality and Central Asia and Nexus? Uh, an interesting thing is that in Uzbekistan, uh, court rulings, as far as the enforcement is concerned, are anonymized. So it prevents uh, information about the parties uh, leaking out. Uh, Natalia, correct me if I'm wrong, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, those rulings are not even published. Right. I could add uh, that in Ukraine, all court judgments are publicly available and only the names of individuals are anonymized. So you could find a lot of internet information if uh, the parties are legal entities. So you could find any judgment about setting aside and enforcement of arbitral awards in public domain. Uh, dear colleague, dear participants, I would like to introduce our fourth participant. It, this is Hafiz Virji, um, uh, who joined us just a little late. Uh, Hafiz, we are just discussing the benefits of the arbitration for the CIS country, and we have just discussed the confidentiality and enforceability. If you can add something, Please. Yes, certainly. So, first of all, I'm delighted to join the Bishkek Arbitration Days and uh, apologize for this uh, delay, which is due to personal circumstances. Um, to the broader question of, the, uh, of our panel, I think it's a timely topic, and more specifically to the question of arbitration for CIS parties, I will add to what my colleagues have been saying, a comment about neutrality. It's all very well to be talking about a dispute resolution forum, but when you're talking about parties from different, with different nationalities, from different backgrounds, neutrality is essential. And neutrality in arbitration means two things. There's the neutrality of the forum, meaning neither side needs to um, go to the other side's courts and there's a neutrality of the arbitrators, which traditionally is understood to mean a neutral nationality as compared to that of the parties. Now, there are different ways in which we can expand um, a discussion on this topic. Maybe for now, I'll only add that um, I think Ilya may be talking about uh, flexibility or certain other considerations. And so not to overstep too much on what he will be saying, if you look at neutrality, part of what it um, part of what it achieves is the ability as well to be equidistant from the parties culturally. And more specifically in our context, it means that you can, while being neutral, be culturally sensitive to both sides because of the flexibility of the process. Which means that then when you look at why arbitration, CIS parties can have the confidence that they're buying into a process which understands them while being acceptable to the international counterparts. Uh, thank you, Hafiz. Uh, Ilya, as Hafiz re referred to you in, in part of flexibility, maybe you add something on this point. Thank you, Hafiz. Uh, another obvious benefit that comes to my mind when it uh, comes to arbitration is, is flexibility. And the question arises, flexibility to what extent and flexibility compared to what mode of dispute resolution? Uh, in general, uh, arbitration offers greater flexibility as compared to national litigation, right? The degree of flexibility would depend, of course, on the mode of arbitration, be it ad hoc or institutional. 
on the applicable rules, on the applicable laws. For example, uh, if we take Kyrgyzstan uh, into consideration, the uh, degree of flexibility is rather uh, wide and rather high because uh, the uh, scope of arbitrability is large. The um, requirements as far as the arbitration uh, procedure is concerned, the mandatory requirements are rather limited, uh, but it may not be the case in other jurisdictions, right? So uh, it is flexible and the parties can tailor the procedure to their needs. Uh, more often than not, the CIS related disputes that are referred to arbitration are construction disputes. And this is where the flexibility comes into play and truly shines. Because in national courts, uh, when you have a construction dispute and you want to appoint an expert, usually the court would appoint an expert based on the suggestion of the parties. So you are losing this opportunity to present your case the way you wanted to. In arbitration, each party would have its own expert. So the chances are equal and there is no third figure who would decide who would be the expert in arbitration. Another uh, issue to consider is representation. Usually, there are no limits as to who can be a representative in arbitration, whereas the national court would require you to hire a local bar member, which may not be uh, convenient for you, not to say uh, may not be uh, appropriate because the local bar member may not be uh, speaking your language. If we are talking about, say, uh, China, Kyrgyzstan contracts or China, Uzbekistan contracts, uh, this is not a problem in arbitration. You can be represented by anyone, not even a lawyer. So in general, to sum up, arbitration is flexible and this is something the parties are considering when drafting their contracts, when adding their arbitration clause. Thanks a lot, Ilya. Um, I would ask a question. Uh, you know that arbitration is always associated with the high prices. And I'm interesting is, uh, does this benefits come uh, with the price? Maybe some of our experts can add to this question. Ileana. Uh, so, you know, it uh, would uh, greatly depend, uh, of course, of the institution chosen. Uh, and even within uh, one institution, there are different set of rules with different, uh, uh, with potentially different uh, fees applicable. Of course, uh, when you have a choice of having experts uh, or having uh, some uh, flexibility, uh, this would add cost as well. Uh, if you have any additional services, uh, available to the users that would definitely entail uh, additional costs, but it does not mean in uh, all these situations that it's uh, it's something disadvantageous because it's up to the users to decide whether they want want to to have this additional service or not. So uh, and that is why when we talk about flexibility and uh, the uh, financial issues, I think it's it's very good that the users could choose. They could choose the option uh, depending on the uh, financial uh, uh, status, possibilities, and that is why I think it's uh, also sometimes it's expensive, that's true, but still there are many ways how to make it more cost efficient. Thank you. I referred to confidentiality earlier. I think that the, the disadvantage of that is that uh, I think publicity is, is good discipline for, for arbitrators. If you're making decisions in public, then you tend to take greater care to get them right and to give good reasons for them. Um, and if uh, arbitrators are relieved of the obligation to um, justify their decisions to the, the, the world at large, um, then lazy habits can creep in and um, doubtful reasoning is, it can uh, appear more, more commonly. And another thing that, that should be said about arbitration, uh, generally it's possibly an advantage, um, is that there are very limited rights of appeal. And uh, that, that 
means that disputes end more quickly and cost less money to, to, to get to a final result. But it does mean that mistakes made by arbitrators generally do not get corrected. So um, it, there is more risk uh, in that sense, um, in, in the one-stop process that arbitration entails. Uh, if I may add, uh, just uh, uh, came to my mind that uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, benefits, uh, if we compare state litigation in the region and international arbitration, one uh, important option uh, is also to look for um, external funding. So there is a, a growing industry of third party funders. Uh, they're normally not based in the region, but they could uh, give uh, funding for international arbitration cases. They would probably not uh, fund any domestic litigation uh, case. And that is why international arbitration gives uh, this uh, additional advantage of uh, having the dispute resolved uh, using someone else's money rather than uh, to, to, to go to the state court in the region where the potential uh, respondent uh, is located. And of course, uh, again, uh, further to, 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 to just to mention additional services and financial issues uh, uh, related to them uh, in arbitration, we could uh, have uh, uh, we could record the hearing, we could have transcript, we could have various types of translation, uh, either simultaneous or consecutive. And so all this is available. Of course, uh, this, this is uh, not for free, and this probably uh, makes uh, the proceedings more expensive. But again, this is a party's choice. Thank you. I may, I may add uh, something to that extent. Uh, first of all, yes, it comes with the price, answering your question. The other question is, is this price affordable or is this price reasonable? And it will depend on the drafting of the arbitration agreement, which we discuss later and which uh, our panelists for second session would be discussing, because much would depend on how you agree in your contract whether you have three arbitrators, one arbitrator, whether you have institutional ad hoc arbitration, whether you have early dismissal, everything would influence the price. Uh, adding to what Elena said, uh, we have a number of third party funders registered for the conference, and it means that they are interested in Central Asian market. But the question rather to them, not to us, whether they are interested to invest in small and middle-sized uh, claims. Because at the end of the day, most of the cases that receive third-party funding are large-scale disputes. And most of the parties who are disadvantaged by the price of arbitration are small and middle-sized entities. So if third-party funding is available in Central Asia to small, small and middle-sized enterprises, uh, I would say, and this was my prediction, the number of cases from Central Asia would skyrocket. I might add two thoughts here, if that's okay. One is, it's implicit in the discussion, but I think it's worthwhile making explicit. Namely, there's a part of the difference between domestic and international arbitration is a difference in terms of comparable dispute resolution opportunities. Domestic arbitration can be compared with litigation because it, it's all in the same, in the same uh, frame, as you might say. Um, and then you are definitely comparing time and cost. Whereas international arbitration, you don't really have that many alternatives that are binding, that are transnational, and allow you to achieve a, uh, an enforceable outcome. And at this point, then my, uh, I will add as a second comment, which is something that I would have um, added earlier on in the conversation, which is part of what sets Delos dispute resolution apart is not only its emphasis on efficiency, but its proportionality in terms of costs in relation to the amount in dispute to the point where even on small disputes, it remains affordable and appropriate as a solution. 
thank you all of you. Uh, really interesting issues you raised. But uh, now we are smoothly move on to my next question. Uh, I would I would say that the question on arbitration agreement is one of the most a fundamental question in the all arbitration procedure. And if you don't mind, I would like to ask our prominent speakers, uh, provide our participants um, very um, short and information about the, um, about the form in the arbitration agreement, like ABC uh, for arbitration agreement, um, if you may. Maybe Ilya, could you please start? Thank you, Natalia. So everyone understands that an arbitration is a creature of contract. So you must have a contract in place to be able to refer your dispute to arbitration. And the question here is what dispute, right? How to draft this arbitration contract properly to have the dispute you are having uh, arbitrated? Uh, and it brings us to the first issue of arbitration clauses and arbitration agreement is the scope of arbitration agreement, the scope of arbitration clause. Uh, the scope of the clause as such would depend on a plethora of factors. The first, of course, is drafting by the parties. The second is the law of the seat. The third would be the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. So how one would interpret or construe the arbitration agreement. As far as the first uh, factor is concerned, the drafting, the rule of thumb would be to go with a standard clause offered by many institutions. Why is that? I reckon, and I wouldn't be lying, that each of us at least once encountered a clause that was overly complex that was so poorly drafted that at the time the arbitration were to be commenced, you wouldn't really understand whether this dispute is covered, is caught by the arbitration agreement. So the rule of thumb would be to go with the broadest scope possible and to go with uh, uh, standard clauses recommended by arbitral institutions, because these clauses are history tested, they are stress tested, and they are usually up to date. Remember the ICC model clause that was amended after the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation judgment requiring the name of the arbitral institution to be mentioned in the arbitration clause. And that's the case for, for Kyrgyzstan, because unless the name of the arbitral institution is mentioned, the arbitration clause is invalid. So you have to mention it. Uh, so as far as the scope is concerned, be broad, because you never know what dispute you'll have down the line. And unless you're a very sophisticated party or unless you are being advised by an outside counsel or you have an experienced in-house counsel, uh, just use a standard, standard wording, because this would save your time and costs down the line. Uh, th thanks a lot, Lia. Uh, maybe other speakers can add something to a recommendation of Ilya. Well, I agree with what Ilya said, but okay. um, particularly keep it simple. Um, and in fact, it is generally sufficient just to, to say that disputes will be referred to arbitration under the rules of a particular institution um, without them going into detail about what the process involves. Um, because as soon as you stop drafting de detailed provisions about how the process will work, they will inevitably conflict with the rules of the institution. And th th then you get disputes as to which prevails and what was really intended. And if you've got multiple agreements, there'll be inconsistencies between the various arbitration clauses that have certain procedural consequences that, that, that you don't want. So um, I think, um, yes, use precedence and keep it simple. The only thing that you probably should give particular thought to is whether to appoint a sole arbitrator or, or a panel of three, um, un unless it's a very high value dispute, there's a lot to be said, in my view anyway, for having a sole arbitrator. It's much cheaper, it's more efficient. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if I may uh, add a couple of words about uh, scope perspective first. So uh, I, I think it's also important uh, to uh, double check uh, the existing court practice in a potential jurisdiction of enforcement of arbitral award because sometimes, uh, so as already mentioned, uh, this uh, Russian uh, court case uh, led to the change, the tectonic change, yeah, of approach uh, to arbitral um, to arbitration clause in a particular jurisdiction. And uh, effectively, ICC has different types of standard clauses for. So it has like one standard clause for uh, uh, the majority of jurisdiction, and then uh, there was a clause for China. And I think the same clause is now applicable for or recommendable for Russian cases as well. And in Ukraine, the, the situation was quite similar in terms of uh, the, the, the very uh, quite silly uh, court approach that you need to mention the arbitration institution in, in the arbitration clause. And that is why, uh, until the recent reform, there were several uh, negative cases uh, on enforcement and setting aside of uh, arbitral awards or arbitration uh, clauses. But uh, after the reform, Ukrainian courts are obliged to interpret any defect of arbitration clause in favor of its validity, enforceability, and uh, possibility of being performed. That is why we don't have this issue now. But in terms of scope, uh, for instance, uh, Ukrainian courts uh, may not consider that interpretation of arbitration clause, if it's not mentioned uh, expressly in the arbitration clause, is necessarily included into the scope. And there were a couple of uh, strange cases considered by the Ukrainian courts where they came to the conclusion that if it's not mentioned expressly in the wording of arbitration clause, then it's not covered. Uh, and that is why you, you need to be really uh, careful when you draft your arbitration clause. Sometimes you need to add some uh, types of dispute depending on the jurisdiction where you're going to enforce your most probably your arbitral awards. Uh, in terms of uh, number of arbitrators, oh, we we'll, we'll move uh, later to that topic. We're still on the scope. Please, uh, because it was mentioned. By yeah, yeah. But Alexander, and it's a very interesting question, again, a tricky one, because surely you have uh, three uh, important uh, documents uh, which could influence uh, the number of arbitration or arbitrators in your dispute, that is the arbitration agreement, uh, applicable arbitration rules, and uh, arbitration law of the seat. And they could have quite interesting interplay uh, between themselves. So even if you have in, uh, so if you have one arbitrator in your agreement, then most probably you will have your dispute resolved by the sole arbitrator. However, uh, if uh, uh, you mention three arbitrators, for instance, that uh, does not necessarily mean that in the end of the day you will have three arbitrators in your panel because for instance, some uh, arbitration rules uh, as ICC uh, has introduced the rules that for uh, uh, fast track proceeding, uh, which is uh, opt-in uh, option, uh, the court could uh, change the number from three to one. And this uh, is considered like pre-agreed by the parties when they choose ICC rules and they agree that it could be one arbitrator. Or, for instance, in England, as I know, even you have uh, three arbitrators in the clause, and uh, some arbitration rules of the uh, institution seated in uh, London, or for ad hoc arbitration, I think, if one party appoints, uh, claimant appoints the arbitrator and give, uh, gives notice to the other party that uh, the other party should appoint uh, uh, his or her arbitrator, otherwise the arbitrator appointed by the claimant would act as a sole arbitrator. And as I understand, this could happen. And uh, if you are not prepared for some uh, such development, you could uh, uh, and uh, simply misses, miss your uh, deadline for appointing uh, uh, the arbitrator's respondent, you could end up with a sole arbitrator appointed by the claimant. And uh, another uh, situation, if you uh, have not uh, uh, chosen uh, the number of arbitrators in the uh, arbitration clause, sometimes you have put two arbitrators. For instance, in maritime cases, 
In some uh, institutions like Phosphor, for instance, you could have two arbitrators. So the one appointed by the claimant, the second one appointed by the respondent. And they, if they do agree, they could resolve the dispute uh, just uh, by two arbitrators. If they do not agree, then they could have an empire or a third arbitrator or uh, uh, it, it, it could have different titles, but uh, at the end of the day, they, you will have three arbitrators instead of two. Oh. Could I just um, uh, comment on that, just because I see there's a question, which is uh, an interesting question, and, and um, one, one which touches on what Aliona was just talking about. Um, the, I don't know if people can see it, but the question's been raised as to whether parties will now adapt their dispute resolution clauses to, to cater for changes of circumstances such as the, the pandemic, and if so, how? And I think that's one very good example of a, an area that people will now have to give more thought to. Um, it's some, certainly something that's arisen in a case that I'm currently involved in, um, uh, which is what happens if one or even more than one of the arbitrators becomes incapacitated. Um, and uh, most rules do cater for this, but in a rather cumbersome way that requires a, a second appointment process, um, and uh, either by the parties or by the institution or even by the court. And um, that's not very practical, particularly if you're three years into a long case and approaching a final hearing, and uh, a replacement arbitrator simply doesn't have time to get up to speed. So I, I do think that parties will need to consider providing expressly that in the event that an arbitrator becomes incapacitated or, or can't participate for any reason, then the, the remaining arbitrators, whether it's two or one, uh, should be able to decide the dispute um, on their own. Um, obviously, remote hearings are something that will have to be written in, I think, because, um, I mean, in general, I mean, in my experience anyway, arbitration has coped very well with the, um, the pandemic and the need to move to re remote hearings. Um, but uh, I think it, many people will want the comfort of knowing that they are guaranteed a hearing, even if it can't be a physical hearing um, or not. I mean, there may be parties that are so, so value the right to a physical hearing, they don't want a Zoom hearing. Um, that, that, that's also understandable. But I think, that, again, that's something that parties will need to think about and agree, um, because certainly the types of arbitration that are going on now whether they're good or bad, um, are a long way from what anyone would have contemplated at the time when they signed their arbitration agreement. Uh, may I add two, more, two cents to, to, to the answer to the question? I think in the future, uh, the arbitration clauses or any dispute resolution clauses would be more carefully drafted to address the change in circumstances. And which... It, it reminds me of the, the sanctions war or the arbitration reform in Russia, because in the interim, we had to draft arbitration clauses that say, look, if this arbitral institution is approved, the dispute would be arbitrated by this arbitral institution. If it's not approved by the Ministry of Justice, then it should be referred to this arbitral institution. Same for sanctions war. So if this arbitral institution cannot administer a dispute because of the sanctions, then the dispute would go to another arbitral institution that can administer uh, this dispute, um, notwithstanding the sanctions. And Natalia, you mentioned that uh, ICSE under, Bishke, uh, under Kyrgyz Chamber of Commerce was not operating uh, during the pandemic's time to, to a certain extent, you know, not normal business or operation. So the arbitration agreement referring the dispute to ICSE in this particular case can be considered frustrated. So what the party should do, they can have a separate uh, submission agreement, you know, change the arbitral institution or uh, change the procedure for dispute resolution, but they can also include something anticipating certain events in the future in the arbitration clause itself, if one can predict something to happen. Because the pandemic and the coronavirus crisis was unpredictable. So you cannot say, uh, look, in the event there would be a pandemic, uh, then this arbitration clause is no longer valid or this arbitration clause shall be construed as follows. But if you are able to predict certain events, yes, uh, I'm more than sure that the arbitration clauses would be more sophisticated in the coming years, trying to anticipate what may happen in the future, what may affect the arbitral procedure agreed. 
thank you very much, Ilya. We have a um, question on a, from our participant. It's related to what you have said. Uh, should the arbitration clause reflect to the changes uh, according to the pandemic situation? But uh, could you please just a little more elaborate the question on the language of the arbitration agreement? I think it's also very important. Uh, sure. Although it's not related to, to the question of our participant, and other uh, part uh, or pillar of the arbitration clause that is often neglected is the language of arbitration. This is a particularly relevant to bilingual or multilingual contracts, because at the end of the day, you'll have a dispute with your counterparty as far as the language of arbitration is concerned, and having a explicit provision saying that the language of arbitration shall be English or shall be French or shall be Russian saves time and cost down the line. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Alexander, may I ask you to to share with us your opinion about such condition of arbitration clause as a seat of arbitration? Is it important or not? How do we manage this clause? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so just on a point of terminology, um, every arbitration has a seat, uh, which is a place, but it, it denotes not the physical place where the arbitration takes place, but the legal seat, so, so the, the place where the award is deemed to be made. And um, in practical terms, the, the significance of it is that it, it is the courts of the place of the seat which have supervisory uh, jurisdiction over the arbitration. So uh, the, the courts which can issue injunctions or secure evidence um, and, and, and grant other kinds of uh, interim remedies. Um, that affect the arbitration. Um, so the choice of seat is important because uh, different different national courts have very different attitudes to arbitration and different remedies that they are prepared to grant uh, in, in relation to arbitration. And it's also in the courts of the seat generally that the award will be challenged in the first instance by the, by the losing party. Uh, so again, uh, different different national courts are have different attitudes towards arbitration awards and some are much more um, willing to uphold them than others. Um, that is why the choice of a seat is important. It should ideally be somewhere where the courts support arbitration and can be relied on to act efficiently uh, to grant orders where they're needed and, and also obviously impartially. And that is why uh, it's no coincidence that the most common seats in arbitration are places like London, Paris, Switzerland, Stockholm, Singapore, Hong Kong, which, which traditionally have been known for having efficient and um, uh, neutral judiciaries um, with, with a, a positive attitude in, in, in support of arbitration. And it's why, unfortunately, uh, despite the heroic efforts that are going on in places like uh, to, um, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, and other CIS countries, um, and there is a lot of great work there being done by, by people to set up arbitration institutions and, and draw up rules and so on. Um, they, are, they are at a disadvantage because their national courts in those jurisdictions are not known for being either neutral or uh, to have a particularly positive attitude towards arbitration in some cases. Um, so so, so, so this, the seat does need to be chosen with care. Um, the seat is not necessarily the place where hearings take place. As I say, hearings can take place anywhere in the world or, as is happening at the moment, nowhere in the world with, with all the participants uh, sitting in different jurisdictions. Um, so you, you don't necessarily need to reach any agreement on that. But, but the seat is important. Um, and um, I was going to go on to mention a recent case in the English Court of Appeal um, uh, where... Um, uh, but, but uh, Natalia, I don't know, maybe I should come back to that because it, it's, it's on a slightly different topic. Sorry, Alexander? So uh, I was going to go on to mention the, the recent case in the English Court of Appeal um, about the, um, the law governing the arbitration agreement um, and, and why that matters. But perhaps I should come back to that later if there's time. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Um, Hafiz, maybe you can add something to our discussion about the 
uh, drafting the arbitration agreement? Any other important points? No, I'll be happy to. Um, and I think the, the one aspect that perhaps hasn't um, been developed uh, fully yet is the difference between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. But just before I come to that, um, there was this, uh, on the discussion about seats, the, there's one notion I care for very much, which is the notion of safe seats. And, okay, I, uh, which is a notion of safe seats. And I don't know if um, to what extent people are familiar with this, but I would define a safe seat as one that does not materially increase the cost for parties to arbitrate, whether that be directly or indirectly from having additional requirements. And I think when you're thinking about writing your arbitration agreement, there's a temptation to seat the arbitration where you are located. But in the flow of our conversation, which of what benefits arbitration can bring and at what price those benefits come, thinking about the seat and going to Alex's point, bearing in mind that the seat of arbitration doesn't mean that that's where people are meeting or holding a hearing is critical. Then more specifically about the distinction between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. Other than in maritime arbitration, arbitration is typically conducted under the auspices of an institution. And this institution provides rules and administers a dispute. In contrast, if you don't have an institution, parties must determine their own rules of procedure, thereby creating an ad hoc framework which is why the name. Now, why would you choose one over the other? The arguments in favor of institutional arbitration indirectly point to the challenges of conducting an ad hoc arbitration. An institution provides predictability. For example, regarding the commencement date of the arbitration. It also reduces the scope for issues around the designation and remuneration of the tribunal. And then an institution exercises a control function. For example, regarding the fees of the tribunal, you avoid unsavory situations where a tribunal might be saying, can you up my uh, remuneration? It allows you to address issues of challenges to members of the tribunal. So for example, if you don't have, if the arbitrators whom you thought were neutral or independent or are impartial, finally come across to you as being biased, then you've got a forum in which to raise that without having to go to court, because that would be the alternative. And the control function can typically extend to the quality of the awards, meaning institutions frequently exercise some form of scrutiny of awards. Now, if you were to balance out the picture a bit, ad hoc arbitration allows you to completely tailor your procedure to your needs. And it's a bit like if you decided that for this webinar, you were going to build your own web browser and build your own live streaming procedure. In other words, it can work, but you want to exercise that with care. Ila? If I may, yeah, if I may just add a comment with regard to the last two topics, institutional versus ad hoc and seat versus venue, it's also important if you choose institution uh, to look whether the institutional rules allow to uh, choose uh, the seat of arbitration. Uh, because uh, for many institutions, the, uh, the rule is to have the seat in the jurisdiction where the situation is physically located and registered while other institutions do allow to choose the seat uh, in any jurisdiction of the world. And actually, uh, if you have, say, ICC, you could choose uh, the seat uh, in any uh, jurisdiction, in, including Kyrgyzstan, for instance, uh, and you could have uh, Kyrgyzstan seat in uh, ICC arbitration. While I assume the local institution in Kyrgyzstan, ICAC, does not allow to move uh, outside Kyrgyzstan to have the arbitration. In, a, in any other jurisdiction. So it's important um, aspect to, to check. Thank you. And if um, I could, sorry, I'll just add one point. 
to, to, and this is just this goes to the overall conversation, which is when you have a dispute, you want to be focusing your resources on resolving that dispute. And so really the importance of the conversation we're having right now is you don't want to have issues with your arbitration clauses that create additional disputes for the resolution of really what's at the heart of uh, your problems. Um, yeah, cool. May I add a quick, a quick note on seat, okay. seat and venue? And linguistics in arbitration. In many languages, uh, there is no distinction between seat and venue. And if you're drafting a multi-language contract or bilingual contract, it's always advisable to have the place of arbitration and place of hearing instead. Because say in Vietnamese, when I tried to explain the concept of seat and venue, uh, I was surprised that they can't grasp the idea at all because there is no distinction between seat and venue. Same for Russian language. Seat and venue can be used interchangeably. So when you're drafting a contract, it's advisable to have place mm -hmm. of arbitration if you want to refer to a seat and place of a hearing if you want to specify a venue. Um, dear colleague, thanks a lot. I'm really fascinated uh, by the level of our discussion, but unfortunately time is going and we move on, move on to the end of our session. Just in order to summarize the, our discussion, I would like to repeat the question which I put in the, at the beginning of our discussion. Can arbitration be the answer? And if you not, don't mind, I would ask all of you uh, during a minute or short, just share your opinion about the, uh, about, uh, share your opinion about the look forward conclusion about the future of the dispute resolution, please. Uh, may I start answering your question? So the most common answer you get from a lawyer, it depends. Mm -hmm. So arbitration surely is an answer. Whether it is the answer depends on a number of factors. Your contract, your disputes, uh, whatever crisis there will be in the future. Because you never know whether the arbitration would be capable of tackling the crisis. As far as the pandemic is concerned, yes, arbitration is a viable option. Many arbitral institutions continued operating during the lockdowns continued accepting the cases, continued registering the cases, continued appointments. So there was no interruption as far as the arbitral procedure is concerned. Uh, in any event, in any event, arbitration after coronavirus crisis would never be the same. And I reckon the coronavirus crisis would affect the way arbitrations are conducted going forward. So the parties may be referring more to online modes of arbitration, be document-based only or be virtual hearings. So arbitration would change. Whether it would answer the complexities of the tomorrow, of tomorrow, you will never know. Thanks a lot, Ilya. Um, do anybody want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I agree with what you just said. Um, I think that arbitration was already well set up for uh, these sorts of uh, circumstances. And we were already used to hearing witness evidence remotely, um, to exchanging documents electronically and using electronic hearing bundles and so on. So the only thing that's new is, is the, the scale on which these sorts of techniques and technologies are being used. Um, and generally it, it's adapted very well and no doubt there are going to be some teething problems but it is quite a robust and flexible system and I'm sure it will be uh, continue to be used. If I could just add one word on the question that's been asked as to whether uh, in a corrupt environment um, arbitration is more prone to corruption than, than court proceedings or, or not. Um, my very quick answer to that, it, it, it's a very interesting question which could probably fill a whole session but um, it's, arbitration is less prone to corruption, I think, for the simple reason that if you have a three-person tribunal, um, you're only likely to be able to corrupt one of them at most. Um, and at least two of them should be appointed by the other side and or by neutral authority and be from a very different culture. Um, and it, it is 
it's going to be more difficult to corrupt than even two members of the tribunal, which you need in order to win a case. Um, uh, there are no doubt horror stories that everyone can can recite about where things have not gone as, as they should have done. But generally, I think arbitration is more neutral, um, as uh, uh, Hafez was explaining earlier, um, than court proceedings would be in a in a state where the courts are known to have problems with partiality. Alexander, did you have any experience with such cases, especially in developed nations? Uh, I have not, to my knowledge, been involved in a case where a tribunal has been corrupted. I mean, of course, the, it's in the nature of corruption that one never knows. Uh, but uh, I have had a, a case, it's a, it's a different form of corruption, but it's something that arbitrators in particular need to be aware of. Not whether the tribunal is, is bribed as such, but where the proceedings themselves are used as a means of money laundering or some other uh, illegality. So quite often you, you, you see it, well not quite often, but sometimes you see a, a dispute which mysteriously settles and the tribunal is asked to make an order endorsing a settlement agreement for the payment of large sums of money un, under an award. Um, and you do wonder whether there was ever any real dispute in the first place or um, whether, whether it's somehow a collusive process that, that shouldn't be happening. So that that I have seen, um, but I haven't, as I say, to my knowledge, encountered bribery and arbitration. But, but clearly there are cases where it has happened. Thanks a lot. Uh, Alona? Uh, yeah, I, I could uh, uh, follow the discussion of uh, whether arbitration could be announced. I totally agree with previous speakers and it, it really could be. And it has proven during this crisis that it could adapt. Uh, it's flexible uh, enough to adapt to uh, rapidly changing circumstances, even with although arbitration was prepared, uh, better prepared than the court system, uh, it still has adapted to uh, unprecedented lockdown in uh, many countries, so many institutions uh, uh, am amended their rules to make their proceedings uh, paperless or close to it. They allowed to file those documents uh, in electronic form. Uh, so we, we had, and now we even uh, we, we have even more online hearings. So and we probably will have new normal uh, after this uh, COVID nineteen. And uh, this is something discussed uh, very broadly. It's interesting that the COVID uh, situation um, also uh, gave a new uh, life, for, so to say, to the Green Pledge uh, initiated some time ago by uh, one of uh, well-known uh, international arbitrators. So the, the idea behind, behind this is to make arbitration more eco-friendly and to the impact of arbitration to our environment. So this is again about uh, traveling, about using a paper, etc., etc. So and the changes we see uh, indeed makes arbitration more green. It's interesting. Thanks a lot, Hafiz. It's difficult to come after everybody when I agree with it, what everyone has said. Um, I'd say maybe two thoughts. One uh, that goes in this same trend as what everybody said, which is um, arbitration has done very well. It's definitely a dispute resolution mechanism for the 21st century. It's proved it over the past few months. It's adapted rapidly um, on the point of um, th there, there were, for example, certain forms of inefficiencies that have been that have adapted very fast, such as um, the practice that you still see in some places of filing a case with paper, that doesn't work when everybody's in lockdown. Um, and that raises issues of legal certainty when you want to know what the commencement date for your arbitration is and uh, when was your statute of limitations interrupted. So arbitration has done very well and it's embraced technology very rapidly and very effectively. I'd say maybe since I'm coming at the end of uh, this conversation, a word of caution perhaps for arbitration. As, as arbitration becomes even more prevalent in commercial disputes and is and prevalent not just in terms of the number of disputes, but in terms of the, 
which disputes are coming to arbitration versus going to court, there is a risk that commercial law doesn't keep adapting and evolving in the same way as when cases also go through the court system and whether um, a stated precedent system applies or an implicit one applies, commercial law evolves as a result. So I think there is a question for us arbitration practitioners about not necessarily the confidentiality of arbitration, but about how we show our work product, how does commercial law keep evolving on the basis of all the work and all the thinking we're doing and on the basis of the new issues that are arising that would, had they gone through the court system, um, given rise to the commercial law adapting to the new problems we encounter in business. That's the word of caution I put out there, but I'm happy to, um, uh, for my co-panelists to say otherwise. Um, dear colleague, thanks a lot. I see that we are on time. It means that we manage our session very good. Unfortunately, we have no um, time for the question, but I tried to include the questions uh, during the presentation of our speakers. So I hope that all questions which were asked of our participants were covered by the during the discussion. Uh, from my side, I would say uh, thankful for all of you for the really fascinating, insightful discussion, for your interesting answers, for the questions. Thanks a lot. I would like to say thanks, many thanks to the organizers for the good organization of this session. Uh, I would say that uh, our session come to the conclusion. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thank you so much for moderating and thank you for joining this arbitration days. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you.